is a Working Wednesday walkabout, and it's going to be primarily about sowing seeds that will hopefully germinate and bloom next spring, and also fertilizing, doing a little bit of root pruning, and then just a few more things that I need to get done before I leave for Singapore. So that's kind of what's going on here today, starting with this area. Now you may recall that in one of the walkabouts, I believe, I cut this back severely. And then I put a top, a top dressing of a whole bag of that Happy Grow landscape conditioner that I got at Lowe's. And I think it looks good. I mean, there's it's lots of negative space, but I think it looks good. But underneath all of this mulch, Stuart, come here, I want to show you this. I'm so excited. Let me see where the green patch is. There's a couple coming up. So I told you that all of that creeping phlox or thrift, it's also called, it's uh, the variety emerald blue. It blooms lavender in the spring in front of my tulips. But I cut it back really hard and I told you that the root system underneath was still viable and that it would start putting out new growth. And look, I love this so, so much. Can you see that, Stuart? Oh, yeah. Can you see the tiny new growth? Look up here, this is really starting to come out. Now, why has this come out now, even though it's still pretty hot? Well, the temperatures have gotten into the 90s. Here's some more. Each time I see that, it makes me happy. Um, the temperatures have gotten into the 90s, but we actually got some rain the other day. So I think that encouraging it to, by pruning it, to flush out with new growth was helpful. And the fact that we got rain was helpful. And I think we may in the next week have some more rain in the forecast. And so I am going to put some, uh, just a balanced fertilizer down. This is 444. This is some of that Zen blend from Turtle, but you could use Turtle. any kind any kind of organic granular. So when you ask me how I fertilize, this is one of the answers to the question. So in this space right here, and I pretty much have already looked at the directions for how much to put down, but this is, this is organic, so it's not gonna burn. And it's gonna be very good for the soil but it will also encourage even more growth coming out on that emerald blue phlox, especially because right now there's not gonna be any competition in here for, from anything else. Look here, Stuart, here is some purple oxalis that I cut way back and it's already starting to come out again. Can you see it all right there? Oh yeah, I got that in my front. Do you really? Little porch thing, it comes back every year. And it can really handle strong sun. I got that oh, yeah, from... In, well, I guess it has that oak tree, so it's a little blocked. But yeah, yeah, I got that from my friend Rob, my friends Rob and Jim, who have a marvelous, marvelous garden. And it's also interesting for me to observe when I cut it back really hard, and this is something that I want to record in my garden journal. Now, Stuart, if you don't mind, come over, come over here, because I want to show you that this is some I did not cut back, and this is kind of what it looks like. It just looks tired, and there's lots of brown on it, which is why I cut it back. I may choose to cut this back also, but it can't hurt for me to come in here and kind of proactively and preemptively add a little bit more of this balanced fertilizer. And it will likewise help this chartreuse Joseph's coat, which is the only annual I have in here right now. So this will help now. It will also help in the long term to improve the tilth of the soil and just overall. And this is my kind of garden and just throw it yeah, yeah it's want. kind of your well the thing is about about a lot of organic granulars is you don't have to be as exacting as you would certainly if you were putting down a chemical or something like that and i am always especially generous i guess here's a silly question can you overdo it 
you probably could overdo it and especially if you did not think it was really going to saturate down into the soil and run off into a sewer system or if you were over, over fertilizing near a pond or a water area water feature but this uh, I the other thing about this is it's not going to run off because so it's less about hurting the garden, more it, about the like, environment around it. Yeah, it's about the environment around it. And obviously you don't want to burn things. But as I said, this is very low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's just a 444 blend. So it, it, I don't have to be quite as careful as if it, if it were more intense. So that's what I'm doing on this area right now. And I anticipate that it will really begin to put out more shoots. Now I started to say earlier that I'm gonna record in my garden journal where I'm starting to see new growth first. And so in this case, I'm starting to see it on the east side of this flower bed. So I'll know then to watch progressing around this little hump here, I'll know to watch and see where it comes up later. And that just is instructive to me if I, in the future, do something like that again, and I'll, I might begin to worry, well, why isn't it coming up on that side? Did that side die? No, it's just that side is tardier and is a little bit more lethargic in, in coming up. So this will be great. I am thrilled and I'll be, we got a good rain the other night, but we definitely are still in arrears and we need more. Oh, is that the fertilizer I'm smelling? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, okay. Yep, yep. It's that good, it's that good <laughs> manure smell, Stuart. I was now, just like, man, what drove by? <laughs> okay, let's come up this way and I'll talk a little bit about um, my beloved Encore azaleas that I love. Um, which is always ironic for me to say that because when they first came out, I didn't like them and now I just adore them. So you know that I think they're what I call warrior plants. They're tough as can be. I've got some scattered throughout my landscape. I've got some here, here, there are some in here. And these are reblooming azaleas that I have told you over and again, they, they will bloom in the spring, a little bit in the summer, and then they will rebloom in the fall. And because it was so dry this spring and because they were still getting established, they, they bloomed, but not as heavily as I anticipate they will bloom in the fall. So I've got some in here and I've got a whole bunch of them in this area right here. And Stuart, you can see this one, I believe this one is, uh, don't, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but this is called chiffon something. And it's got this beautiful coral color and it's starting to put on buds and come out. And you can see this here too. So as we progress into fall, these hopefully will really put on a good, a, a good heavy flush of bloom. But I'm going to encourage them by putting down some holly tone. And you can see on the outside of Evergreen and Azalea Food, this is made by Espoma. And it too, we'll put links, but this too is organic and it gives very clear instructions on what you want to put down. So for these are, I would, I would call them established plants right now, one cup per foot of drip line diameter. And drip line is basically the circumference of the plant. So wherever the, for example, the drip line of this one, where this branch extends out to here, the drip line is pretty much, if you do a circle, that is pretty much the drip line of the plant. So this is going to call for one cup per, uh, per foot of drip line diameter. So I'm gonna come back in here a little bit later. I'll be a little bit more exacting with this measuring than I am with the other, but I've got a number of them here. Now, I, my palette is mostly the pinky rose, the pinks, um, kind of magenta pink, but I, I do love this chiffon color and I'm thinking in my next, my next garden, I would heavily focus on that and the white. Another, another kind of thing that I noticed um, that I want to pass on to you, the taller ones that are more rhododendron-like, 
and the intermediate ones, they seem to be tougher in our really intense heat than the ones that are more low growing and dwarf. And why that is, I don't really know. I believe there was one called maybe Ivory Angel. There are so many varieties, it's really hard to remember each one. But the ones that are, are very dwarf and diminutive, to me, those seemed to not perform as well in the heat as the other ones did, which have performed beautifully. And once these get really established, these have been in for a year and a half to two years now. Once they get really established, then I won't even have to baby them much at all. So this is, this is what I'm going to use on any of my evergreens, boxwoods that are recovering right now, uh, some of my yews and my azaleas. So I'll be doing that throughout in here with the exception of this, this just common Chinese boxwood. I will not be fertilizing it. But the other things I will, and I probably won't fertilize again until next spring. So I'm doing that as my fall application and it talks on here about exactly when you fertilize. So I'm being pretty uh, specific about this because so many people have asked me how I fertilize. And there's an idea on those parts if you guys ever want to see them. Remember, you can pause the video there. And yeah, pause the video want. there and, and you can look. And we will put up links. Now something else, some of, I, I, I do use miracle Grow which is not organic uh, hose on my hose end sprayer, but I only use that in container plantings because I'm not really, I don't really care so much about, Stuart just I got just a skilled, mosquito. I just killed a mosquito with my chin. With your chin and your, on my, and your knuckle? It was on my knuckle and I- The that, mosquitoes, wow. Sorry, historically this summer have not been too bad, but Stuart, they're really bad right now. So this we are, even, even for me, we have on our bracelets, we are sprayed, um, and she has a bracelet I literally am covered head to toe. Covered head to toe, <laughs> yes, yes. The other thing is that as I am doing this walkabout, this working walkabout, I'm making sure that I am emptying out any standing water, and there's standing water in a lot of different places with the exception of my bird bath that I leave alone. Okay, the next thing that I wanna talk about is, I showed you how I have pretty intensely gone through and clipped off dead wood on the evergreens on the boxwoods and yes you can safely prune out dead wood really at any time of year so for example i've got these ewes here that really the ewes really had a hard time this summer it just was very hot for them so these have some browning on them and some of Some of that that is, that is browning further down on the stem, I can just slough that off. It'll get crispy and I can just slough that off. But larger branches, can you see this here, Stuart? I can like, get a little closer to Like this one. I'm just gonna go ahead and snip that completely off. Very, very light pruning and I'm just pruning out stuff that's dead. The other dead needles, I will just try to slough off like that. And that's how I can make these look a little bit more presentable. And you see, I've got one here, I've got one here, one here. These are Japanese spreading ewes. This one really took it on the chin during one of our ice storms and it decimated about half of it. So it's still in a recovery mode, but it is starting to recover and you can see all of that new growth coming out at the bottom. And this is what I love about having a relatively small garden is these are things I can tackle pretty easily on my own and I can really monitor them. I don't have acres and acres of plants to monitor. I've got just a few to monitor. So I can, I can do that. It's manageable for me and it also constitutes what I, what I consider to be good garden fit. It fits with the amount of time I have. It fits with the amount of gardening I want to do. It also fits with the amount of energy and, um, and fitness level. So that's what I talk about when I talk about good garden fit in my book. And I, I really addressed it the other day. I did a radio interview with, um, with, a pair in 
Joey and Holly in Wisconsin and I talked about what is good garden fit and this is what I'm talking about. So for me, a small garden fits better than a larger garden does with, with the way I live my life, with my garden lifestyle. Okay, I left these out in here because I wanted to show you. If you get packing material like this and it's filled with air, this makes a great lightweight filler for the bottom of container plantings. If you're wanting to take up volume in a really, really large pot, then these work pretty well, especially if it's something that's not going to be particularly long lived, like a large evergreen in a pot, but something that's that, um, that you might want to plant seasonally because this will work really well and, and is a lightweight alternative. Now I'm still doing some major things. I've been, or semi-major, I've been watching and waiting on this U and trying to determine if I wanted to go ahead and just prune it back or completely shovel prune it. And I think I've decided that I'm gonna shovel prune it. So let's, uh, let's look at it here. Stuart, have I already asked a question of the day? You know, I don't think so. I don't think I have. So here is gonna be my question of the day. If you were me, there's no right or wrong answer. There's just an answer that's, that's peculiar to you and what you want to do. Would you leave it, prune it back, and see if you could save it, or would you take it out completely? Well, in my case, I've decided that because I am really liking the negative space that I've created by, by shovel pruning other things, I've decided that I'm going to shovel prune this. Now it may be that I am not, this has been here for a pretty long time. So it may not come out as easily as something. I'm trying to remember if we've ever used the term shovel prune before. Shovel prune. Um, I like it, it makes sense. I just yeah, don't, yeah. it sounds or, unfamiliar. Uh, and it's not technically pruning, I guess, because oh, I I'm taking out the whole thing. And, <laughs> and you know, that may, that may be a take, on what the official term is. I can't, I can't maybe a Linda I can't remember. If so there's my second question. If this is if that expression is a taken on something else, then let me know. But I was talking earlier about how I I'm liking more negative space up front, less living mulch as I have described it than I have in the past and why because living mulch, even though it does provide good coverage from the soil and, and does can help hold in moisture, it nevertheless, to look good, has to live. And that is a big drawback that I think we discovered this year is a lot of our ground covers and things and even certain shrubs that we used, they just, oh, that was satisfying. They just couldn't handle the intense heat. In which case I may not use quite, or I'll use different forms of living mulch. So that was the before and after on that. I'm really into before and afters lately. What do you think, Stuart? I like it. Do you like it better? Because well, now the boxwoods really stand out. Now. Yeah, the boxwoods and the boxwood will get more light. They will grow more symmetrically, and it ex once again exposes a longer vista into Stuart's favorite thing. Your stone, Stuart. That's nice. Has been exposed. The other thing is, remember that there's all sorts of things in here that have gone to seed. So the columbine's gone to seed. Some foxglove has gone to seed. There's all sorts of things in here that will flush out again later, but can then be cut back. The other reason that I'm thrilled about it is because I have, I think, 800 tulips coming from color blends. Love me some color blend tulips, really any of their bulbs. And so now it will be easier for me to identify spaces where I want to have tulips and I'll have more latitude in where I plant the tulips than I have in the past because things were so much more overgrown. And again, I don't mind, Stuart, if you would step back. 
So you can see that really the overall effect is in no way, I think, diminished by not having that, that you there. No, I think, I think it, it looks, it, looks, yeah. it almost act, makes everything else stand out way more. Yeah, stand out better and it makes it look a little more clean lined. So I have more negative space, which then brings me to the next thing. And maybe the last thing I'm going to do, and that is I'm going to spread some seeds. So Stuart, if you would follow me up this way. Now this, you said 800 bulbs, right? Yes, they'll be about. That number probably sounds really big to a lot of people. And isn't that less than you normally do? Uh, oh, well, it's, it's less than the overall amount okay. that I plant, front, back, pots, all of that kind of thing. But typically, in a given year, I will plant anywhere from six to 800 tulips in the front yard. So thank you for clarifying that. It just and, always seemed like such a big number to me. Well, it is a big number, <laughs> uh, but it makes a big impact. And I think you will... Uh, I think you will find that sometimes it's it's easier to plant a whole bunch of them than to select one or two here and there. And yes, I plant them in great big numbers and we will, we've showed in the past how I plant large numbers of tulips and I will show it again when my, when my color blends tulips arrive. My sister will be doing the same thing because I bought 500 for her and her new husband or soon to be new husband as a wedding gift. So, I've got three buckets of seeds here. And I'm embarrassed to say, I, I harvested, you probably saw me do it, I harvested all sorts of seed from the front and backyards. So this is columbine. And let me put that down and see if I can. A lot of them have already dried and are at, um, have fallen out. Okay. Oh, Talk good. about separating the wheat from the chafe. So, yeah, this is the hole, and see these little black specks, which also resemble caterpillar poop. <laughs> Very well. I was about to say, in case you wanted to know, um, those are columbine seeds. And I usually, by now, I have already separated all of these out and gotten and separated the seed from the husk. This year I have not. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but there's plenty of seed that has dropped to the bottom and directly from this bucket. You can just reach down there and grab them. Yeah, I can just reach down here and grab them and get them. And I'll, I, I'm going to broadcast some of them around here. Now this is foxglove seed. And most of this has already fallen out of the holes. This is a very, very, very fine seed. Okay, here we go. See those tiny little specks oh, wow. right there? Those are small. Like, like, like grains of sand, which leads me to my tip. This is so fine that when you spread them, it's just real easy for them to all clump together. And what you want is to have a little bit more space between each germinated seed. So typically what I do is, a lot of this has probably fallen to the bottom. And how I, how I harvest this, I've showed this before, is I put it through a strainer so that then all the seeds, like here's a bunch of seed right here. See all of that? That fell to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll take that seed and I will get an old spice jar, like red pepper flakes or something like that. I'll get an old spice jar. I'll fill it up about halfway with dried sand then I'll put in this very fine foxglove seed. I've demonstrated this before. This very fine foxglove seed, which is about the same size as sand granules. I'll shake that jar really, really well to evenly distribute these tiny seeds throughout those tiny grains of sand. And then when I come out, I am just going to season <laughs> 
my spaces wherever I want this foxglove seed to germinate. Now, I will do that as an insurance because I know a lot of foxglove, here's a little one here, there's a little one there, there's lots of dormant foxglove seed in here just waiting to germinate once we get enough rain and once uh, the temperatures are appropriate. But as an insurance policy, I'm gonna come and I'm going to spread more foxglove throughout these areas and it will be so easy to do. Why? Because I have so many bare areas now, I won't have to lift up a bunch of foliage to get underneath the foliage. I can just broadcast it and spread it here. The other thing that's going to be amazing and why it will work so well is because one of the reasons I love this kind of mulch or it works with gravel, really anything, is that there are lots of little nooks and crannies and spaces in this mulch that then that tiny seed will fall into. And it will kind of warm that area and it will protect those little seeds and then they will germinate and it will protect the little seedlings. So now I've created throughout here all sorts of area where it will be very easy to scatter seed. Now the last seed that I'm going to scatter that I harvested and periodically I send I mail seed to people for different reasons. I've got some custom made Linda Vodder seed packs and periodically I mail seeds to people for things. Um, but this is Minoan lace and it's related to Queen Anne's lace. It's a shorter, more well-behaved variety. I got this from a, originally a plant from a friend of mine and it goes to seed pretty prolifically. And here, and this is one you want to have, you do want to have on gloves typically when you separate these seeds because these are spiky. So see, they're like little porcupine little seeds. And these will stick to your clothing. They'll stick in a variety of different places and they tend to be rather prickly. However, that makes them good and able to self-sew pretty reliably because those little barnacles stick help up. hold them in place. Wow. And so I can come through and I can sprinkle some of these. Likewise, I could also come and sprinkle some in a pot or wherever I wanted them. And because this is all free to me, because these I just harvested these from my own garden beds, then it doesn't matter if I waste them or whatever. If they come up in some places and they don't come up in others, uh, doesn't bother me. They will grow where they want to grow. I'll sprinkle them wherever I want them and then they will decide if they're happy, germinate, and they want to live with me. <laughs> in that area, so they will pick their own spot. Okay, so that is that. We've co covered fertilizing, seed sowing, shovel pruning, and now I'm gonna come up here and I wanna talk a little bit about my final thing, and that is porch decor. But while I'm here, here's another example of a U that and this is, this is a Utopia U from Southern Living. It's a great plant, but this year was just really hard on U's. And this area used to get more shade than it gets now. And because of that, I think it has suffered. So this may be a plant that later on in the season, I decide to move to another location because it would be happier in another pretty much almost full shade location. And then what I might do is add, um, I planted two extra obsession nandinas here, and that would make sense to have another obsession nandina there. And it might look a little bit co more consonant and it would look better year round. So that may be something else that I decide to change. Which leaves me with planting more of what really works, less of what doesn't work, but also I still have lots of variety in my garden for the pollinators. So I, I have all sorts of things that you don't see now, but that will come up and prove to be great, um, great targets for all those pollinators out there. Something else that I did related to living mulch is in the past, I sprinkled hellebore seed 
everywhere around the garden. So the mama batch of hellebore is over there. You know which, where it is, mm -hmm. don't you, Stuart? Okay, it's, it's over there, just behind the holly tone bag. But then I scattered it because I loved it so much, I thought, oh, I'll just scatter it everywhere. Well, I did, but now I think it makes, this time of year, it can make the garden look messy. Some of it was getting more sun than I wanted it to get, like over here. Oop, got to turn the other way. And so I'm going to. I'm getting there. Yeah, you'll get. You're getting here. All right. So I'm going to prune back what's dead on here, just so that for this period of time it looks more presentable. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to note that this is where it is, and I am going to move it either to another location or. What I will probably do is dig it up. That's a really a good size hellebore. Dig that up, pot it up, and give it to someone as a gift. That is what I think I will do with it, Stuart, because I've got a number of those all around the garden. So I think I'll do that, and that will be a good thing to do. Stuart, just don't trip on my seed bucket, sweetie. I'm trying not to. Want you trying to plant it in the turf for I you. I know, it's hard because Stuart has to do all this walking backwards. Um, one other thing, I'm sorry, I always, I think of this always one more thing. thing. This is the third last thing before we make it to the porch. Oh, geez. <laughs> we will make it, I promise. But this is just a glimpse of how my mind works. And, and you guys know, I, you're gardeners, you do one thing and then you see another thing and then you do it and then, it's just like that dotted line that used to be in the family circle cartoons on Sunday morning where you just run from place to place. That's kind of how we are, but that's how you get a lot done. I noticed earlier when I was doing my morning walkabout with my coffee that I had a number of these Blue Point junipers that have gone to seed in here and look at this one. More little Christmas trees. And I, yes, and I, marked it because I knew I might have trouble finding it again with one of my flags. But Stuart, if you can get down in here, I can show by pruning out some of this ground cover. Look at what a good straight stem that has. Yep. So this would be a great one to dig up that and plant. Right what crazy bug? It just crawled over your finger and onto the plant. Well, I don't, I don't know. I hope it was a good guy and not a bad guy. I'm going to even start printing this a it's little bit. It's black with white stripes. Oh, I, it was a skunk bug then. <laughs> if any of you saw it you. and you recognized it, tell me what it is. I've got one there and then I also identified another one over here, which is why I get these utility flags because I know I'll forget where these guys are hiding. I've got two in here. Let me get around here. Actually, here's see. two and a half. They made a baby. So here's Papa Bear, Mama Bear. Can you see these, Stuart? I'm going to get close and hopefully, yes. Okay. So here is Papa Bear. Here is Mama Bear. And look there. There's a little tiny baby bear right there. Now I can go ahead and dig these up or I can let them get bigger. I will probably dig these up pretty soon because once they start putting down uh, roots, it's going to be, they're going to be hard to extricate from the roots of this tree. So I'll probably dig those up sooner rather than later. So, okay, now Stuart. To the porch. This has been a very long Wednesday walkabout. I apologize to you guys. I don't guys. think anybody's upset about it. Well. Just in case you were wondering. Hopefully you've learned some, some trips. Okay. Maybe so fun. I, by now I've normally done more puffery and more zhuzhing on my front porch. This year there will be less of that than there normally is because I'm not going to be here to enjoy it. And so why? Um, but what garden structure there is here, I want to remain healthy. And by the way, let me just say, and I should have said it at the beginning, but I'll say it now because Stuart's been chastising me. 
I have, I know you're worried. I have announced that I'm gonna to go to Singapore. You guys know I'm going to be gone, but there are people, probably there will be more people here than if I were home. There's people staying at my house. There's people coming and going. Stuart will be here frequently shooting stills. So there will be a whole, and I have a security system and we have security in the neighborhood that drives around. So well, the I, garden's gonna be good. I and the garden will be that's fine. That's everybody's worried about. Everybody's worried about. I, I think <laughs> that will be fine, yes. And, and, and Carrie and Phoebe, whom you met from Calvert's the other day, they're going to do my watering and tending for me. But this is starting to look pretty. I probably am going to take more cuttings of this golden coleus because it's starting to turn gold again. I love it so much. Let it fill out even more. What you cut immediately comes back. So I can be pretty aggressive uh, about the, that. The, the foliage on that is just, it's so, it looks like it's dusted with green. I know, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. And this is more of that Joseph's of coat favorites. that will start turning that really beautiful chartreuse. And then, um, I, I've got, I've got my urns and probably these are just, this is like how you don't waste plants and you save money. I got these uh, jasmine, these climbing jasmine, like in February or March, they were in bloom then, they went out of bloom. I then brought them outside and look, they have been very happy. They look pretty whether they bloom again or not. Now they will not be cold hardy, but for right now, I think they look wonderful in here. And I am, I am thrilled with that. This one I cut back hard. It has some plumbago in it. It may or may not come back. If it doesn't, then I'll just plant something fallish in here. And this is one of those wonderful Oakland hollies that I planted in here. Um, and I'm kind of amazed. The one in the back, the other one that they sent me is a little bit distressed. I think I may have requested, or they may have sent these a little bit too early in the season when it was too hot for them to mail them well. The other one is suffering a little bit. This one is just fine. So these pots will be fine. And then I can do some gorgeousing and some pumpkinizing a little bit later. But for right now, I think Stuart, believe it or not, that is the end of this front yard Wednesday walkabout. Well, sometimes you guys ask, do I ever just get out in the garden and work and look completely grungy? And yes, and today is the day because I'm gonna actually be able to put in several hours outside. I'm really excited. So my outfit of the day from head to toe is starting off with my chapeau, which I got from Dillard's. It had sunscreen in it when I first bought it, but I've had it for so long. Who knows if that sunscreen is still active? I don't know. Um, let's see, my gloves. I am just loving these cool job gloves and I especially love them now because they have recycled ones that are made from recycled fiber, thinking green. And so pretty much whenever I order them now, I order these recycled ones, partly because I just like the look of them, but obviously because they've got a global recycled standard. The other reason I kind of tried to deconstruct why I like them so much, and we'll put a link, but it's because of the way that where they meet the wrist is fashioned. So this is kind of knit. And so it kind of conforms to the size of your wrist here. And because of that, they don't just hang open so that dirt and things can get inside of them. And they're just eminently comfortable and washable, just don't dry them. So that is, that is my, uh, my cool job gloves, which we gave away 10 pair of last time on our live. Yes, we um, my top is just an old navy t-shirt that I really like. But here, here is a reason I really like these old Navy, Navy t-shirts. It's because the base, the, the bottom of them has a slight contour. In other words, they're not just straight all the way around. They have a slight contour to them, which makes you look a little thinner. I never even noticed. But also you don't have as much to tuck if you tuck. And these are old Nike shorts that I got at Goodwill years and years ago. They're one of my favorite workout shorts. And speaking of workout, yes, I got my mojo back and I was up at five and working out 
at six this morning. Are you impressed, Stuart? I am impressed. I went okay. to your boots early. Okay. And then my boots. <laughs> my boots are these that I just love so much. This is my oldest, very oldest pair of high C boots. And why do I love them? Well, I love them for many reasons, but look, I can get in them and out of them without even having to bend over. And I just love that about them. And these, plus they're kind of cute and they match my ensemble that I've got on today. So we'll also put a link to High C Boots, which we have also given away in the past. Love me some High C Boots. Okay, so there you go. Stuart, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. Okay, so there you go. There is my outfit of the day.